All right, and I'll be your second speaker for today. Uh, my name is Andy Edinger. Uh, I'm a grad student at Indiana U University, presenting some work uh, that I carried out with Rob Goldstone, uh, testing the ability of language models to perform on different kinds of categorization tasks using experimental data. Uh, and just for a quick overview uh, on some of the, the models that we're looking at, uh, for those that aren't familiar, um, Word embedding, the word embedding models that we're looking at uh, generally are machine learning methods for semantic analysis uh, that uh, convert language to high dimensional vector representations. Uh, so you can think of different words or sentences as points in space, uh, where the distance between these points in space um, uh, corresponds to the similarity of those language samples. Um, and there's um, about a million different approaches to carry this out. Um, the some of the models that we looked at um the i kind of differentiate into two different classes the static embedding models these are some of the older models from mostly from about five to ten years ago such as word to vec or glove um basically these uh throughout the pre-training process um, or after the training has occurred uh each word or text sample corresponds to one single point in space uh, this stands in contrast to some more recent methods especially the transformers based methods uh such as bert uh, in particular, where uh, the embedding of the word is not based just on the word itself and the pre-training, but also on the words that co-occur in the context around it. Uh, so basically, uh, one word can have different vectors depending on the case, the, the sense in which it occurs. So the, um, one of the common examples of this would be disambiguating word sense. Uh, take the English word bank, for example, which could be a river bank or a money bank. Uh, and depending on the words that surround it, uh, you would get very different embeddings for that word. Um, and um, these, these models have shown a lot of promise in a lot of different tasks. However, uh, there have been a number of critiques of these kinds of approaches. Uh, in particular, common critiques come from their inability to take into account kind of situated properties of these words, uh, right? They're trained on text samples alone. Uh, and so these arguments kind of go that uh, without access to the actual rich experiential properties of these concepts, you know, if you're only taking text into account, uh, you're missing out on entire history of um, properties of these words, right? If you're just learning the word dog and the, the words that it co-occurs with, you're missing out on the human experience of dogs and the, the smells, the feels, the experiences, et cetera. Um, which kind of leads into this general question of uh, to what extent are these latent embedding spaces, these semantic spaces able to capture these situated functions of human cognition? And so to explore this question, uh, we turn to Lawrence Barcelou's 1983 theory of ad hoc categories. Uh, in his paper, he differentiates kind of two classes of categories. Uh, the first of these is common categories or taxonomic categories, uh, which you can see in the, uh, the top right there. Uh, these are what you would probably traditionally think of as categories. So for example, um, precious stones, um, you can see that the responses here, they're kind of all of a kind, right? Uh, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, they go together in a very natural way. You can think of animals or birds or professions or, or things like this. Uh, in contrast, uh, he describes ad hoc categories as highly specialized and unusual sets of items created spontaneously for use in specialized context. Uh, so these are groupings of objects or concepts that are not tied through intin intrinsic properties of the words uh, or of the concepts, but simply through uh, their shared co-occurrence in a situation uh, in, order to, in order to accomplish a certain goal. So kind of the canonical example that he gives is uh, items that you would take from a burning building, uh, which could be diverse objects such as um, family members, pets, valuables, um, family heirlooms, paintings, I don't know. So these are things that, um, you know, family members and, um, you know, valuables might not have a lot in common intrinsically, semantically, but because they are sharing a common goal in that situation, we kind of, he argues that we create these categories on the fly. Um, and um, and as it turns out, so these this kind of uh, delineation of two kinds of categories corresponds quite nicely with the kinds of properties that uh, the semantic embedding models are commonly criticized as not being able to capture. Um, and so to test the relative performance of these models to capture these kinds of properties, we uh, identified several different publicly available data sets. Um, the first data set that we used was um, a replication of the canonical Batik and Montague category norms. Um, and in 
uh, the Batik Montague original norms were from 1969. These were replicated in a, a more modern setting to capture more modern uh, linguistic trends. Um, they they tested 70 um, kind of taxonomic category prompts for 300 participants. Um, there, we couldn't find large scale um, ad hoc norm data sets per se, uh, but as it turns out, uh, if anyone is familiar with the TV game show Family Feud, uh, the kinds of questions that they ask there actually correspond really well uh, with ad hoc properties of, of um, or with ad hoc categories. Um, and so we found some openly available data sets um, and right, these are all crowdsourced answers to questions. Um, so you get kind of typicality ratings. Um, we found a data set of around 700 prompts um, and Rob and I went through and kind of rated all of them and identified 91 that kind of fit the constraints uh, of ad hoc categories um, being uh, questions that are, you know, groupings of answers that were semantically dissimilar, but shared through a common context. Uh, and then finally, we composed extended ad hoc category prompts where we took those, uh, the original data, the original, um, the data set from point number two, uh, and we composed extended prompts for them to kind of give more situational information uh, to the models. So I have a, a few examples of those here. So on the left, you have the, um, basically, the, uh, you have the prompt as it was given to the models. In this case, using uh, BERT as an example, we used its masked language modeling feature uh, where uh, you present it with a phrase containing the mask token, uh, and then BERT finds the, um, the best responses to fill that gap. Um, so for example, from the family few data set, we had um, something a clown might be carrying. Um, and then on the right, we have extended uh, uh, prompts as they were composed. Um, so yeah, in that first case, when the circus came to town and its tent was pitched, the opening act featured an ent entertaining clown carrying a blank, um, and so kind of trying to give it additional information to uh, to capture or to identify the the situated properties. Um, and then the models we looked at. Um, so we I, I used uh, six different pre-trained models uh, and varying across the model architecture and the pre-training data. Um, I can talk more about those in detail later uh, if you want, but um, I basically used uh, three different BERT models, uh, one word to back and two glove models, um, and trained on various things and trying to control for effective training set uh, on the model performance. Um, and then so for results, um, here we have the, uh, this is something like an accuracy curve for the taxonomic or the common category uh, trial. Uh, and so uh, what we did was um, we gave each model, each of the prompts, and we asked it to generate, uh, iteratively more responses to each of the prompts. So on the far left, uh, you know, given the top 10 responses, how many of the responses that the model gives are in, uh, match up with the responses from the human, uh, trial data. Um, and as we can see here, um, the, so the, the top three lines there are the, the BERT or the transformers models. These are the, the dynamic embedding models. Uh, and the bottom three lines are the, uh, the kind of more traditional static embedding models. Um, and we do see greater performance in general from the BERT models. Um, but, uh, and especially on the far, kind of that far right end, um, it, they are not significantly outperforming there. Um, turning to the ad hoc, uh, trial performance, uh, we see significant de decrease in both, as you might expect. Um, these properties are just harder to capture for these models. Um, and across the board, we see significantly less performance. Um, and in some cases, the even the static embedding models um, were outperforming the transformers models. Um, and then for the extended ad hoc model performance, um, we see the most significant difference in models here. Uh, again, you have the dynamic models on top, the static models on bottom. Um, and what we can basically see is that uh, the static models are essentially completely incapable of using that additional information to group object properties. Um, however, the dynamic embedding models are able to uh, utilize this information uh, and capture much more cohesive categories uh, representations than, um, than the static models. Uh, and then here, this is just all three tasks um, uh, kind of compared in one chart. So you can see the difference uh, across tasks. Um, 
And each of these lines is just the, the best of the BERT models, the dynamic models, um, minus the best of the non-BERT models. Um, and as you can see, the green line, the extended context ad hoc tasks, uh, we see this um, just very, very significant difference, difference in performance between the two. Um, oh, and it's worth noting as well, um, as you can see by the number of correct responses on the left, um, oh, and this was out of the, um, we just took the top seven responses from each of the experimental trials. So this is out of a maximum of seven. Um, it's worth noting that the absolute performance of all of these models uh, is not great. Um, even, you know, even at 200 responses generated, it's averaging uh, two and a half out of seven correct. Um, that being said, uh, you know, BERT and these transformers models being kind of relatively recent um, change, uh, you know, progress in, um, in language modeling uh, and the fact that they are able to capture some of the situated properties uh, shows that there is ground to be gained here in learning how to represent this information. Um, and that's my time. Um, I will, um, and actually I'm a little bit over. Uh, I'll take one question now if anyone has one, um, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs>